Hi, we are Terry and Amber Chitwood. We've been married for 22 years and have two kids. Abby, 18, will be graduating this year in May, and Cooper is 11. I was raised in this church and at the age of 11 gave my life to Christ at church camp. I started reading my Bible, praying, and doing the best that an 11 year old could do to follow Christ. I still got in trouble, but I was quick to feel sorrow and ask for forgiveness. Around the age of 13, I found a stack of magazines while staying at my grandparents' house that would change the course of my life. I had never seen anything like them before, and I wanted to see more. That was the start of my addiction to pornography, and it consumed my life on and off for decades. I would sin, feel remorse, cry out to God for forgiveness, only to find myself right back in the gutter again. I would speak at our youth group meetings, be the example my youth pastor needed, all while battling this addiction. Sometime I would go, sometimes I would go for months and even years without returning to the sin. Sometimes it wouldn't even last a day. I would seek ways to find it out, whether it was on TV, magazines, or the internet. A few months before we got married, I decided to buckle down and change. After all, I was going to be married and I didn't need pornography anymore. After we got married, we attended the church most Sundays, but mostly just going through the emotions and checking off the box. Soon the same thing happened again. The call of my addiction was back, only this time it was stronger. I would find ways to sneak home at lunch to get a fix. Then I would call in sick and spend the whole day looking at pornography. After a few times of calling in, my employers would fire me. So I would lie to my wife and make up stories about why they no long, I was no longer working. Same story, different job, only my addiction was growing and I was too proud and too ashamed to admit to anyone I needed help. I gave my life to Christ when I was 10 at a revival in this church. I felt the Spirit very strongly at that age, but can't say I had a strong relationship with the Lord as a child. We moved to Pecola when I was in middle school. Middle school years are a difficult time in life, but especially for a girl, and I started rebelling. I always knew which path uh, to take, but didn't always follow where God would lead. I felt that I disappointed my mom with most every decision I made, but still desperately needed her approval, even when being disobedient. I started dating Terry my junior year of high school. My parents weren't totally thrilled about our relationship, and we got married in August of 98, following my high school graduation. And this was the start of a toxic relationship between my mom and husband, and would affect our marriage for many years. Just a few short years after we married, my dad was diagnosed with cancer and passed away only four months later. I was grieving my dad, and the lies surrounding Terry's job troubles were coming to light. I felt like I couldn't take it anymore and left Terry for a short time. During this time is when we found out I was pregnant with Abby, and we decided we could work everything out. Again, God was at work in our lives, but we did not really take notice or give him the credit. Two years after Abby was born, we were in a horrific car accident that almost took my life. Again, God literally saved our lives. During these years, Terry had several jobs, and at times no job at all. I was the one with steady income that didn't necessarily cover all of our bills when he wasn't working. This left me very stressed and angry and very bitter toward Terry all the time. We were basically living as roommates. Instead of turning to Terry, I confided in my mom about the troubles we had, especially the financial struggles. This led her to have contempt and hate toward my husband that definitely wasn't good for our marriage, but I continued to turn to her because I needed her approval in my life. We had moved to a different town into a neighborhood with some close church friends. I thought this would be good for us, only to find out that they were just as messed up as me. We would party and drink, and a few of the other husbands would openly sleep around on their wives. Amber and I told ourselves that that wouldn't happen, that wouldn't happen to us. It took nine months before I found myself in a position I couldn't or didn't want to get out of. I'd had an affair. I blamed it on being too drunk to know any different and chose not to tell my wife. In reality, it numbed the pain of my addiction, and I wanted more. Not for love, but because for a short time, the pain and shame had stopped. Every time, I would say never again, but I was replacing one sin with a different sin. 
I felt remorse, but the thought of confessing scared me more than hiding it. But sin has a way of exposing itself. Someone who confronted me about it and gave me a few days to tell my wife. I was working away from home at the time and remember locking myself in a room and mustering up the courage to call and tell her. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, I honestly thought I was going to be divorced. Maybe not the next week or the following month, but soon. Every day I would wake up and wonder if this was the day that she would say she was done. I came clean to her and a lifelong trusted friend about everything. And I came to realize that the partying and the affair, both emotionally and physically, were the result of me trying to numb the pain of the shame of my double life. Like Terry said, we moved to this beautiful neighborhood with some nice friends from church, even had small group together, thinking this is the perfect place to raise our daughter. Soon after moving, Terry was deployed for military training and soon after that to war in Iraq. When Terry came home, either for leave or home after the war, the partying just kept going, but I realized all the partying left me feeling empty and depressed. During Terry's absence, I had come to lean on my mom more heavily, which wasn't healthy for our marriage. Soon after his return from deployment, we were pregnant with Cooper. Terry worked out of town for the National Guard during the week and was typically only home on weekends. So now I found myself with two children working full time and I was more lonely than ever. He finally had a job he loved and it was more than covering our finances, but I was growing more and more bitter toward him. I think I was somewhat jealous that he had what seemed like no responsibilities at home, and I was taking care of everything. On top of that, he was about to deploy again, leaving me feeling overwhelmed and alone. We had just sold our house and moved back home to Poto. We found out that our neighbors, whom we were close to, were divorcing, and I had wondered if Terry might be having an affair because he had basically become my roommate, raising our children together when he was home. When Terry called me and confessed about having had an affair, I remember thinking, I'm done. I just don't want to work through anything. I believe myself to be a strong, independent woman that could take care of herself and her kids. However, we were living in Terry's um, parents, or living at Terry's parents at the time. Um, after having sold our home and we were still looking for a place to live, I felt completely alone and vulnerable. We were living in tight quarters with no privacy from our children and no way to process through my marriage falling apart. Terry came home unexpectedly after confessing. I'm not even sure where our kids were, but um, we had time to really talk to each other and spent time confessing our hurts and prayed together. We didn't heal from this immediately, but it opened the door for us to be honest with each other, and God gave me the strength and softened my heart for reconciliation. We had joined a community group, but I still wasn't comfortable being authentic. I turned to God, but my pride kept me from o being open and honest with my community group and seeking prayer and biblical advice. Terry was still having anger issues and would often shut down even when we were just trying to have a conversation. So we again started to fall back into our old patterns. Although we said we would never divorce we, when we got married, I did threaten him a short time later that he needed counseling and if he didn't make an effort that I would leave. He took this seriously and made efforts to attend counseling and connected with other groups and church that helped hold him accountable. As Amber said, I started counseling through the VA, and I didn't want to, re I didn't want to relive anything that had happened overseas, much less talk about it, and for sure didn't want to talk about it with her. But I didn't want her to leave, so over the next several years, I began to deal with my anger and post-traumatic stress. I stopped drinking. Everything was good in my life and in my marriage. Everything seemed to be working out. I was attending a conference in Dallas, and the speaker kept saying, if God is not using you for his good, it's you either had some, you had not received Christ as your Savior, or you had some sin that you, were, you weren't confessing. I definitely had a sin I wasn't confessing. At that point, God convicted me, and I wanted to go home and talk to Amber immediately, but we still had one more day at the conference. It was the longest 24 hours of my life. Um, I prayed and told God that even if it cost me everything, I was going to be right with him. Amber picked me up from the church 
before we got home in the car, <clears throat> I stopped her before we got home, got out of the car and confessed to her that for the last nine months, I'd been looking at pornography. I'd let my guardrails down that I had in place, and I went right back to my sin. She met me with grace, humility, and forgiveness. The next morning, I met with Jason and confessed to him. He met me with the same grace as Am that Amber had. With the help of Jason in the recovery ministry, we developed a six-part plan of restoration that included me confessing to my community group on Sunday, the staff on Monday, the deacons and re-engage group on Wednesday night. I thought the 24 hours was a long time, but those four, four days seemed like an eternity. In re-engage, we talk about drawing the circle around yourself and working on everything in the circle. This starts with growing in your own relationship with the Lord instead of trying to fix everything you feel is wrong with your spouse. Even though we're not as honest, even though we were not as honest as we should have been during the pilot group of re-engage, we were working on building our relationships with the Lord. So when Terry returned from a conference and confessed his pornography addiction to me, it was only through the grace of God I was immediately able to forgive him and ask how I could help him overcome this. Somehow, God, in that very moment, allowed me to realize that this wasn't about me. After Terry's confession, he had what I thought was a panic attack or anxiety, but in all actuality was a heart attack. The Lord spared his life so we could continue on this journey together, and I'm so thankful. God definitely has plans for us, and maybe part of those plans is to be able to share the story of hope, healing, and restoration that he has worked in our marriage. It's been a long road to recovery through mercy and grace of God, counseling, recovery, and ministry, and a lot of rebuilding trust. God has restored and healed our marriage. <laughs> he has helped uh, me step out of shame and into the light of confession and authenticity. Surrounding ourselves with people that hold us accountable, setting up and maintaining safeguard to stop me before I get to the point of no return, and living authentically have been vital to God transforming our lives and delivering me daily from the addiction that almost cost me everything I hold dear. By practicing the skills we learned and re-engage and the support of our community group, piece by piece we've rebuilt the foundation of looking to Christ first and then each other the same way he looks at us. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Don't be afraid to take that first step out of shame and hiding into authentic living. God will meet you where meet you there with the same grace, love, and mercy that he has shown us. God wants the best for you and your marriage. Thanks for letting me share. Can y'all give them a hand? Church, that's the power of the gospel. Um, redemption, it's reconciliation, it's restoration, it's what, we, it's what we look forward to, it's what we hope for in Christ Jesus. Uh, Terry is a young man who grew up in this church, Amber grew up here in this church, and now we get to celebrate uh, a, a guy who once was an adulterer. Who's now one of our deacons? All right, here's a, you know a family that once was broken and now they serve in our marriage ministry. That is the work of Jesus Christ, and that's the hope of the gospel. And it's not just for them. Uh, I would want you to know that God desires to do the same in you. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, that we once were dead in trespasses and sins, then we've been made alive together with Christ, like we have this spiritual awakening, if you will, spiritual rebirth, where we're now new creations. We don't have to live in bondage to sin, but now we can be free from sin. So we have freedom from death, we have freedom from sin, uh, but there's a piece of the freedom that I think we often miss in the church of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus set us free from death. Yes, Jesus set us free from sin. But there's another piece to this puzzle that keeps many of us from really serving and living out the fullness of what Jesus Christ has for us. Today, I want to talk to you about freedom from shame as a result of our past. 
Maybe it's something that was done to you. Maybe it was a sin that you committed, your mistakes and your failures. We often go through our lives living out of, uh, really, it's out of shame. It's a label that we've accepted about ourselves. It's an identity that we've taken on. Maybe for you, your label is an adulterer. Maybe it's an addict. Maybe you're the one who's been abandoned. Maybe in your life you've been defined by your mistakes or your failures by your wrongdoing. Today I want to tell you that Jesus Christ died for your shame as well. And he wants to set you free, not just from death, not just from sin, but also from your shame. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us that God made him, this is Jesus, the pure, perfect Christ. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. That means that for those of us who come to faith in Christ, God took our sin and our guilt and our shame and he placed them on his son, Jesus Christ. And there on the cross, Jesus bore the weight of your sin and your guilt and your shame. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. On the third day, he rose and sat down at the right hand of God. Now, God did all of that so that, I want you to hear the end of this verse, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As God takes our sin, our guilt, and our shame, he takes that off of us and places that on his son, Jesus. There was something else happening. He took the perfect righteousness of Jesus and he clothed us in that. Can I just tell you that you are not who you once were. If you've come to faith in Christ, you're not that old person. You're not the adulterer. You're not the addict. You're not the failure. You're not the one who got abandoned or abused. You in Christ Jesus are a new creation. There's new hope for you, and as, as a result, there should be new life for you. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I don't know how much you know about the city of Ephesus, uh, but Paul was no stranger to the city. He'd spent a couple of years there preaching and teaching and ministering. He knew what was going on. So I want to fill in the gaps for you about the city of Ephesus. If you want to know kind of how the city of Ephesus was, think about it as kind of the San Francisco of the Roman Empire. It was a port city. It had a, a good harbor that you could winter there. It was very busy. It was a center of business and banking and commerce and religion. To tell you what was going on in that city, there was what's known as the Temple of Artemis there. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This temple was so big. It was 400 or 240 feet wide by 420 feet long. You could put a football field inside of this thing. On either side of the structure, there were a hundred marble pillars that they had engraved mythical scenes in them and overlaid them with gold. It was this vast temple and people would gather from all around to go and to worship there. Artemis was the goddess of fertility. You follow up with mythology or whatever, the Roman, the Roman goddess named Diana was celebrated in the same temple. And the people of that city would give themselves to things that you and I would not want to speak of. Man, they had lived, they had sinned, they had done things in that town uh, that would blow your mind. That if you knew about those things, you would think about those people, maybe they're too far gone. They had chased after idols and empty things. It was a rough place. And Paul, having spent two years there, preaching the gospel, had seen the church begin to grow and begin to flourish. And so he writes them a letter. And he's going to begin speaking to them. And you know what he begins with? He begins by reminding them of who they are in Christ Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus. Now, most of us, that would make perfect sense if he was like to the sinners who are at Ephesus. To those of you who have done unspeakable things, who have given yourself to foreign gods, those who have used and abused other, partaken in these crazy pagan practices, we would make total sense to put sinner there. And yet Paul writes to the saints who are in the church at Ephesus. Now this word for uh, saints, it's the Greek word hagios. It really just means holy ones. And he was setting their identity for them. He's like, you know what you're not? And you're not, you're not sinners. 
because of the work of Christ Jesus, who's taken your sin and your guilt and your shame, and he clothed you in his righteousness. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. So, so he's writing to men and women who were saints in Christ Jesus. Then he's going to tell them uh, about what that looks like. He's going to further set their identity for them. So in verse 2, he says, to the, or verse 1, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and pre- peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Not only were they saints, they were blessed. And not just a little bit. Matter of fact, Paul says, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When I was 16 years old, I got to begin to share my dad's truck. And I'll just be honest, this truck was pretty ghetto, all right? So uh, it was a green and white, two-tone Chevy Silverado long bed, two-wheel drive, you know. It wasn't really what I'd hoped for, but I was 16, and anything would do. Um, Now, the truck had some issues. The interior was destroyed. And so you didn't get to, like, slide into the truck, you know, because there were, like, strips of cloth hanging off. You had to like pick yourself up and sit yourself down to make sure you didn't tear the seat up further when you got into it, right? The dash is like all falling apart. It's it's split. It's kind of rotten. I mean, this truck was in bad shape. Uh, As a matter of fact, my dad used to make us carry around a jug of water in case it caught on fire. All right. Yeah, that that was the truck I was in. Now, the worst part was that this truck, um, the air conditioner was broken. And so, you know, that's, you don't have to have air conditioning, right? 16-year-old boy, what do you need? The other side of that was that the windows would only roll down if you had biceps and some vice grips, okay? I mean, it took some work to get the windows down, and, and you only had so many times before you knew that mechanism was going to break. And so I would often drive to school in the summer with the little triangular window that would kind of divert some air from the outside, um, and I would just kind of like lean over to get a little bit of 100-degree air blown in my face because it would cool me off from being inside the truck. So this was a pretty rough experience for my first vehicle. And I remember being in high school, and one of my buddies pulls up right in front of the doors there, and he's got a brand new Chevy Silverado, it's a Z71, four-wheel drive, regular cab, not that lame old man, long bed. I mean, it had a sunroof and a stereo system, and y'all, the air conditioner was cold. Man, I, I love that truck. And I remember just sitting there thinking, man, I wish I could have that. I wish I could have what he's got, that, that nice cold air truck, like then I would be legit if I just had what he had. Now listen, for many of us who are believers in Christ Jesus, we go around with that same envy looking at other people thinking, oh, if I just had what he has. If I just had what she has. What we really believe about ourselves is that God really held out on us. He didn't give us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He gave us like the the low rent version thereof, right? We don't have quite the level of spirituality. We don't have the same levels of power in Christ Jesus. We don't have the opportunity to walk with God like other people do. We, We see our grandmother who was so devoted and we think I could never be like that. We see someone who's a great evangelist or shares the gospel or serves well or gives well, and we think, eh, not for me. As if God in some way held out on us what I would want you to know about yourself. And I don't know about your history. I don't know about your sin. I don't know what's happened to you. I don't know the things that you've done. But what I do know is if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a saint who has been blessed with every spiritual blessing. God didn't hold out on you. He gave everything to you in Christ Jesus. And he wants to use you. He has blessed you richly. He wants you to begin to walk in that, that you could see yourself not as irreparably broken, not as someone who's like disgusting before God or a big like disappointment to him, but to see someone who's a saint, who's been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Paul continues. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You ever wonder if God kind of regrets saving you a little bit? Like, yeah, if God had to do this deal over again, he might decide differently. Like, he's seen the life I've lived. I can't seem to cut it. I mean, I don't know the word. Like, I don't pray like other people. I don't do the other things that super Christians do. I just can't seem to get there. 
Here's your answer. Before the foundations of the earth, God, who knew all, who could see everything you would ever do or not do, the sin, the good days, the bad days, he looked at you and he chose you. He was like, man, I want him. And I want, I'm going to save her. Like, I want that one and that one. You, with your quirks, with your mistakes, with your failures, God looked at you and he chose you. He doesn't regret saving you. He's not disappointed in you. You were chosen by the God of the universe to be saved and to walk before him. You're a saint. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. You are chosen in him. He continues, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. You know how God sees you? Not as a disappointment, not as a failure, not as that label you've been wearing, not as the names people called you, not as the sin that was committed against you, not as a person who was abandoned by mom or by dad, not as a person who's been betrayed, not as your mistakes and not as your failures. When God looks at you because he has clothed you in the righteousness of Christ, he sees you as holy and blameless. And he's not mad at you. He's not looking to punish you. He's not looking to pour out wrath. That was satisfied in Jesus. When God looks at you, he sees you as holy and blameless. And when he looks at you, he looks at you with this. I'm going to continue on. It says that in him, the end of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5, we're holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You know how God feels about you? He loves you. Just as you are. All your quirks, your strengths, your weaknesses, God loves you. He delights in you. In my household, the spread of my kids is big enough that I have a, a seven-year-old son, I have a 12-year-old son, my daughter's kind of in the middle. And uh, to be honest with you, when it comes down to like the chores and the division thereof, there's a pretty big gap between my seven-year-old and my 12-year-old. 12-year-old's pretty responsible, you know, hardworking, all of that. He's starting to learn about what it means to be a young man. And so he can shoulder some load, I can trust him to take care of things. Y'all, my seven-year-old, he still acts like a seven-year-old. He still makes messes, and he breaks things, and he sneaks treats every time I'm not looking. Like, that's, that's who he is as a seven-year-old. But you know, in the evenings, in the rare times that those boys will come and, and sit with me, and I look at them, you know what I don't see? What they can do for me. And I'm not seeing the mistakes they made that day, whether or not they made a mess or ate something they weren't supposed to. You know what I feel for those boys? And I love them. I delight in them. I'm so proud of who they are. Like, I'm just excited to get to be their dad. I'm like, I'm just overwhelmed with love for my kids. And when God looks at you, he's not like, man, I sure wish he'd get his stuff together. I sure wish she would carry a little more load. I wish she'd be a teacher like other people. I wish she could be whatever other Christians are that we often look at and think that's great. And when God looks at you, he looks at you with love and delight. And he wants things for you in the same way if you're a parent here, you want things for your kids. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. The interesting thing here is that adoption in the Roman world was a little bit different than it is in our world. Now, you didn't get adopted as a little baby or a young child usually. As a matter of fact, adoption usually happened when you were an adult. In particular, when kings and rulers would be thinking about the end of their lives and thinking about how they were going to carry on their kingdom, uh, they would be looking for an heir who would be trustworthy enough to carry on their legacy or to continue their kingdom. And so they, they would be looking like, who is someone that I could entrust my kingdom to? Oftentimes their own kids didn't measure up. And if these kings, they would go find someone who's faithful, 
someone that they could trust, someone that was diligent. They would adopt them as their sons. They would make them heirs to their kingdoms. In love, God predestined you to adoption as a son or a daughter of God. And he has made you an heir to his kingdom. You may not see it in you, but as God looks at you, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see your regrets. He doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see that thing that was done to you. He doesn't see the bitterness of the unfair. God sees the saint who is blessed in every way in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He sees someone who was chosen, someone who's holy and blameless and loved and was adopted. When we come to faith in Christ Jesus, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and God makes us alive together with Him. We were enslaved to sin, but God gives us a new, new nature. We're new creations in Christ. But oftentimes, we have this old identity, our old sinful flesh, and we walk throughout this life carrying the weight of our guilt and our shame. Jesus died to set us free from that shame and to give us a new identity that we would begin to see ourselves not as we once were, but as we are now. We begin to live out of that identity, letting go of our past and our sin and our guilt and our shame and begin to walk in this new life with a new name and a new identity in Christ Jesus. So the question is, because when I look in the mirror and I get, I get up in the morning, look in the mirror like you, you do, um, I don't often see, man, beloved. I don't always see blessed in Christ Jesus, chosen, child of God. You know what I see? I see weakness. I'm reminded of my past sin. Sometimes I fall back and I'll begin to walk in shame. So how do we walk in this new identity for who we are in Christ Jesus? Number one, you have to take off your old self. I know that's a really strange way to phrase it, but it's literally like we have to unclothe ourselves from those old identities, who we once were, that what that inner voice might say to us, and instead we clothe ourselves with Christ. But we got to take off our old self. If, if you've read in John chapter 11, it's the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was his friend. Uh, they had come to Jesus, hey, would you, would you pray? Would you come and heal Lazarus? He's sick, but Jesus didn't get there for four more days, and he'd already been dead. So he's standing before the tomb, and, and they're going, hey, Jesus, before we move this stone, you need to know his body's been in the grave. It's going to smell. There's something offensive in there. There's something that people would turn their noses away from, that they would shudder to even look upon. Jesus says, move the stone away. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, if you know anything about the Roman period, they would embalm people a little different than we do today. They would wrap them in spices and in, in linens and these strips of cloth to uh, attempt to preserve the body. And it wasn't just like a little bit. They were like heavily wrapped. And so there's this portrait that's described of Lazarus coming forth that says, The man who had died came forth, and he was bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. I mean, this is like the, the maybe the kind of the, a uh, foreshadowing of a zombie apocalypse. Like, uh, here's a guy, walks out of the grave, wrapped in all these wrappings. His face is covered, and this guy comes waddling out of, of the grave. And Jesus says, unbind him and let him loose. If you have the, in, in, in the NIV, it's going to say, take off his grave clothes and set him free. And for those of us who have been made alive together with Christ, been made new creations, we have this new identity in him. Many of us, we don't live a victorious Christian life because we're still bound by the trap of the grave, of the old self. It's the old shame. It's the old guilt. It's the old way of life. We think, that's who I am still. But Jesus would say to us, just as he said to Lazarus, take off those grave clothes. Set them free. Set her free. You are not who you once were. You're not dead anymore. And that doesn't define you anymore. You have been given a new life. And so we take off that old person, that old way of thinking about ourselves. 
You're not an adulterer. Maybe in Christ Jesus, you'll be a deacon. You're not an addict. In Christ Jesus, you're an overcomer. You're not a, a failure. And you're a delight. In Christ Jesus, everything has changed for us. Not just that we've been made alive again. Not just that we're new creations. We have been given a new identity and when we begin to see ourselves as Jesus Christ sees us, we can begin to live that out in our lives. And so we take off the old self and we put on the new. Paul wrote to the believers in Rome. And he told them to put on Christ, which is a really strange thing to say. Unless you realize that, that what Jesus is talking about here is like being clothed with him. Paul writing about being clothed with Christ. Like you shouldn't look at yourself and see the weakness and the brokenness and the pain and the old identity. You should see Jesus because the Holy Spirit of God now lives in you. Put on Christ. To the Galatians, he says, you are going to be clothed with Christ. When we let our guilt and our shame go, when we put those things aside, we can put on the new identity of who we are in Christ Jesus. God wants to use you to do miraculous works right here and right now. If you are a believer in Jesus, there's hope for your family. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, there's hope for your neighborhood. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, there's hope for your workplace and your school and wherever you may be. Church, we have a sign out front that says we are one church in a couple of locations or a, a couple of campuses and hundreds of locations. There should be light all over this city because this city is really full of people who are saints, of people who have been blessed in every way, with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, people who have been chosen by God, who are holy and blameless in Him, people who are loved by Him, who have been adopted as His sons and daughters to be heirs of the kingdom of God. Like there's hope for our city because you're not who you once were. Because God has made you brand new. So you take off that old self and you put on Christ. Today we're going to have a time of invitation. What I'm going to ask you to do during this time, I'm not going to ask anyone to come up here, but I'm going to ask you to do this little exercise with me. The thing that's come to mind when I talk about your past, when I, if I were to ask you the question, maybe not the thing that you tell other people, but the thing that you think about yourself when no one can see or hear, the thoughts that you have inside when I ask you, who are you? Today I'm going to ask you to entrust that to Jesus Christ. For me, I believed I was irreparably broken. I believed that there was no hope for me to get better. That I was always going to walk in the sense of guilt and of shame. Well, God has set me free, and he wants to do the same for you. So right now, I'm going to ask that you to bow your heads with me. The band's going to come up and play. And during these next few moments, well, would you just kind of do business with God? Be before him. Know how much he loves you. Know that Jesus has already died to bear your sin and your guilt and your shame. But in a sense, we have to let go of those things. Would you just confess to God? That thing, would you give a voice maybe to the sin or the failure, the sin that was committed against you or the sin that you did, the thing that's come to define you in many ways? Would you just name that before God? You don't have to do it out loud, but just right where you are in your seat, like, God, here is this thing that I believed about myself, that I'm broken, that there's no hope for me, that I can never live this victorious life, that maybe I can just make it to heaven one day and that'll be enough. Listen, that's not what Christ wants for you. Would you give him that today? Christ wants to take that from you. He's already borne it. Will you let go of that old identity? Sinner. Mistake. Abandoned. Addict. Abuser. Unloved. Dirty. Stained. Would you give that to God? Would you look upon Jesus on the cross and know that he bore that for you? Endured the cross, scorning the shame. And he did it for you that you didn't have to bear that any longer. But instead, would you open your hands before God and would you receive the fact that you've been made a saint? That you have been blessed in every way 
in the heavenly realms in Christ, that he chose you just as you are. He's made you holy. He's made you blameless. He delights in you. He loves you. He's adopted you as a child and made you an heir to his kingdom. Can I pray for you today? Lord Jesus, we're your people. And God, we pray that you would continue this work that you began in us, God, that we wouldn't stop short. And we're, we're thankful, God, that you've made us alive from being dead in trespasses and sins. God, we're thankful that you've made us a new creation, that we don't have to live enslaved to sin any longer. But God, would you help us to embrace the new identity we have in you, that we're not what we once were. We're not our sin. We're not our brokenness. We're not our failures. God, we're so much more in you. May we be a people, a church, who lives out, who believes about ourselves. We're a holy people. That we, just as we've been reconciled to you, we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. God, may we be your people in the city in our families. May we take hold of everything that we have in you and begin to live that out. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.